So, warm welcome to everybody and thank you for departing from your wine and cheese. <laughs> I'm very sorry for that, but I think the topic is worth it, very worth it. Um, we will start with a very short introductory round, not more than one or two sentences, just in case somebody knows not somebody who sits here. Might happen, yeah, accidentally. And then we'll straight dive into the topic with a short statement again about if you believe Pilatus is more than a worker or not too much about it, just your thoughts, your initial thoughts, and we take it then from there, if that's okay. So I would say we just start, even as a man, yeah, on this side and just go through the short introduction. Is that okay for you? Yes. Right, please. My name is Aaron Spector. I'm from Jupiter, Florida. And I came upon Pilates while in graduate school and how to make a decision, do I take a course on vestibular rehab or Pilates-based rehab? Mm -hmm. And I made the right choice. Because <laughs> when I saw the physical therapists moving and teaching movement mm -hmm. in these courses, and then I saw the dancers who, back in that time, it wasn't split up fitness and rehab, I levitated towards the dancers. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were some that were pretty. Now, the main thing is, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> the main reason was they could move. They understood movement. They could give me better feedback about my movement. And I realized I was not a mover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I then began teaching with Elizabeth Larkham and, and Brent Anderson. And, and that's where my journey started. Thank you so much. Brent. Uh, my name is Brent Howard, and um, I am the uh, Director of Education for the United States Pilates Association, and I also have my own studio in New Jersey, which is called the Pilates House, and um, I think that's about it. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Uh, well, later, you're free, I will ask you to... Well, you know me, it's hard to stop me. Okay, right, it's okay. Brent, we want to hear more. It's okay. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, okay. Can I? This is Brett Howard. Yes, what about your young people's education program? There. Yeah. 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 And I also um, have been working on uh, buddies for children and youth, and I am currently with the. Uh, Pilates Method Alliance for their uh, Pilates Youth Program, and uh, myself and Celeste Sopic are uh, right now uh, working on that project, and we are going to have a manual that will be coming out on how to work with youth, hopefully at the next PMA meeting in uh, October. And, uh, oh, it's in Fort Lauderdale. In Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Florida. Uh, and uh, it is a passion of mine, and I have, uh, I did my uh, thesis on how to work with uh, younger children at NYU in Pilates. Uh, we had the option of doing either dance related, and I've decided to focus on actually on Pilates and not dance, and it's definitely one of my passions. So. And he's writing a book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to know about Brad? I can tell, I'll fill you in. If you haven't taken his class yet, you have to try it. <laughs> Kathy, you continue. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kathy Corey, and I have been teaching Pilates since 1979. In my journey in Pilates, I was very fortunate to have um, met and worked with uh, several of the master teachers, and their influence, including this wonderful master teacher here, um, is really the foundation of the work that I, I teach today. And I'm just always so pleased to be able to uh, be with a group like this who really wants to go more in depth about the work. So I'm just happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Alan Herdman. Um, I'm based in London. This is my um, 43rd year of teaching Pilates. I started the journey in 1969, not knowing a thing what it was about. I was sent to London by the London School of Contemporary Dance to do this exercise thing. <laughs> so, but the interesting thing was that I worked with Bob Fitzgerald and Carola Trier, and I came back to London and there was no one in England that was teaching Pilates. 
So my journey went towards uh, physiotherapists. Um, I did Tai Chi and, and different therapies, which helped me to uh, form the way I teach now. And although I think um, the technique that Joe developed was fantastic, my feeling is that if he was alive today, he would be changing it. And my feeling is we have to look at the 21st century when we're exercising people and to realize there are major differences. And I, I, for me, it's a continuing journey and I've be, always been passionate about it and still am. now for 55 years. <laughs> and uh, I was very fortunate to start out really with Carola Trier, who was also Alan's teacher, and she was uh, Joe's first pupil to open up her own studio in, uh, uh, in New York. And uh, I was sent there by a uh, doctor when I had a knee injury and I was a dancer at the Metropolitan Opera Ballet. And it's been a romance ever since. I just love Pilates, you know. It's like, and he says, my husband, that it's beyond a uh, passion. It's an addiction. <laughs> 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 You're here. here. You're here. So ground for addictions. <laughs> and... Uh, as you know, I came here because I had a mentor program and I was uh, called and someone said, why don't you come and bring your mentor program to Germany with Claudia because I cannot go to uh, Florida. And I said, how close are you to Mönchengladbach? And she said, 20 minutes. And I said, I'll be there. And from the moment I came to Mönchengladbach, I said, I can feel him, I can feel him, I can smell him, I can see him. And then I said, I better keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and then say, Lolita's Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> but then I met other people who were like, that were also <laughs> Lucy. <Lucy's. laughs> so to me, it's just delightful to be here and to be able to have all these wonderful people whom I love around me. And to have you here. And we're going to keep growing this because this is going to be like Salzburg was for Mozart, or Beirut was for Wagner. This is going to be the Pilates Center. Of the world. And it's going to be like going to Mecca. <laughs> to spread the word about what happens here and how close you get to Lolita and Alan and Amit and Reiner and Kevin and you know, you've got everyone here. Share with your friends. We're having a hard time getting everyone to know. That's right, that's right. Yes. Kevin. Kevin. My Kevin. name is Kevin Baldwin. <laughs> I've had a little involvement in the Pilates community over the yeah. last 18 or 19 wow. years. Uh, I became very interested in Pilates, started teaching, realized we had some problems with the community being organized, and um, started to talk to everyone about that, much like you guys had done from Switzerland. <laughs> and in the year 2000, we, uh, myself and Colleen Glenn, co-founded the Pilates Method Alliance in the United States so that we had an organization to bring the Pilates community together. And the PMA started the first national certification exam that we're very happy to say is now accredited in the United States by the National Commission of Certifying Agencies um, on a level that is on par with many other certifications in our country. Um, so during that time, I was told by Kathy Grant that I had to call Lolita San Miguel, and I called her up on the phone and introduced myself, and she's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I invited her to come to Miami, and we started the PMA that way. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I've known Lolita now for 13 years, 
and we're uh, actually working together, I'm helping her put together her instructor training program, Lolita's Legacy. And uh, I have a, a, an assorted and varied career in the Pilates industry, but I'm very passionate about it, and um, I'm happy that I'm here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amit. Hi, my name is Amit. I'm originally from Israel, but I'm based in London, in the UK. Um, originally trained with um, a teacher in Israel who trained with Deborah Lesson, who trained with Corolla. Uh, so that was my original training, and then I started training with Rail Isakovich from Pazi. Um, and after a few years, I started working more closely with him towards becoming a faculty, so teaching the Pazi teacher training courses. Uh, and I've been doing it mostly since. Um, in my studio, I have a studio in London, and then um, traveling to other places, mostly to Japan, <laughs> because of my good friend Yai here, um, and some other places. And um, yeah, really happy to be here today. Thank you. And so my name is Naina, and uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not so famous for teaching so long or something like that, <laughs> although I did the Basi education too. Uh, but I'm more famous for my community work for the Contrology Forum and trying to keep us together somehow on a daily basis, speaking with each other instead of speaking well, in corners about each other, yeah, which happened in the past quite often. Yeah, so that's my, my, my help and my thought I, I'd like to bring to the table also tonight, and thank you so much, Lita, for inviting me to moderate this. So, taking from there, um, I... No. Oh. <laughs> taking it from there, I, I would love to, to get from everybody of you here on the panel, and for sure you are, like last year, invited to jump in whenever you have a burning desire to share a thought, yeah, please do so. It worked quite well last year, too. Um, in your mind, in your thought, do you believe Pilates is just a mere exercise, a workout, or is there something more? Not too deeply now, what is it? I think that should be for the rest of our discussion. I think that's very important to understand better. If we say it is a lifestyle or it is a philosophy, what we do mean by that? But first of all, is there an agreement here on the table? So, or do we need to pick up somebody as the advocate Diaboli to say it is not something like a lifestyle, it's purely a workout? So, maybe you start, and maybe we go just fluently forward. Um, so, I'm not going to be that person. Because <laughs> one of the things I tell um, my students and my clients um, all the time is that. I hate being a Pilates instructor. I love being a Pilates teacher. Uh, because for me, the instructions is the first few moments. This is what you do. This is your setup. And for me, that's the most boring part. I'm, I don't find it extremely interesting to say, lie down here and do this. But I love watching people and working with them, and correcting them, and seeing how they change and how they grow, which for me cannot happen if they just leave it at exercising thoughtless exercising, so um, that definitely is my point. So growth beyond thoughtless exercising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, actually, I, in my opinion, I think it's both. Okay. So uh, I think uh, over the years what occurred a lot of times is that it, it got a little watered down and, and as the training happened, it uh, became very slowed down and specified, but it's exercise. And it's also a lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle that is contingent upon the instructor, the teacher, being able to convey to the students something that they are going to learn and embody. And I was always taught through all of my training that if you're a really good Pilates teacher, your students are not going to need you anymore because they will be able to do it on their own. So that is embodying a lifestyle because it's about an internal transformation that happens to you as the person who does it. That's what I think. Okay. 
Well, I'm in agreement with Kevin in the sense that it is definitely a workout. I don't think they come to us to uh, have a chat. I think they come to us to work out. At the same time, that workout be becomes a lifestyle. And uh, when we feel good about it and when we have that wonderful satisfaction, that keeps us going and that keeps it from being a job but a passion is when we feel that we can really touch people and serve people and provide something that is, young, uh, that is beyond a workout and that we can influence their lives in uh, a nice manner and that we can make them healthier and let's face it uh, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. And uh, uh, no one is happy, you know, in bed. So they, excuse me about that, but yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll reconsider that. Well, I'll that go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, you know, you know what I mean. It's wonderful to <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful to know that we can really help people change and change their bodies and be healthier. And be happier. And well. be happier because. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be less than a philosophy, but more, let's say, choosing a better lifestyle, which leads them to more health and more optimism and Absolutely. Whatever, in the upper mood because they are healthier. Absolutely. Okay, yes. good. Oh, then, thank you. Um, I, I should start with a mantra that I have in my studio and with my training course, which is client first, technique second. Okay. And my belief is that uh, although I am committed to the technique, I think one as a teacher has got to look at the person you've got in front of you. And there's a lot of the exercises that for a lot of people are not good. So as teachers we have to be very concerned about the lifestyle of the person who comes to you and decide how much you can change and how you'll change it. And even if someone doesn't look amazing, when you think from when they've started to exercise to halfway through their program, their physical change for themselves is very important. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we look at the body beautiful and think, that this person should look a certain way, they will never look that way. And if you try and get them to be something that they never will be, they'll be very frustrated and go somewhere else. So my belief is very much to look at the person, and you may start very basically for quite a long time and gradually introduce <coughs> the technique, and then but decide which part of the technique you should introduce because there are some of those exercises that I don't think he would be doing these days. And we have to be very careful how we look at people, the way people's lifestyle is now. It's so different from it was when um, Joseph was developing his technique. And my favorite thing is flexion is not something we should be doing too much of these days when you consider our lifestyle with computers, with driving. We need extension. And sometimes people who are inexperienced teaching the technique do too much flexion. And that's just an example of looking very carefully at what your person needs. And also you may give them an exercise and then realize that that is not working, so let's get rid of it. Or put it to one side and go a different route and come around to the exercise in a slightly circular route rather than plugging straight away. And I mean, I have clients in their 90s who look fantastic for 90. But knowing how they were when they started, to an outsider, they don't look amazing. But I know how they, how they can move around, how they can get up the stairs, how they can manipulate themselves in traffic. And for me, that's important. Thank you. 
uh, I was recently <coughs> interviewed for a, a magazine article, and the question that I was asked was, uh, what other types of exercise do you do? I thought long and hard, and I said, I don't. I hate exercise. <laughs> so I guess I have to say it's a lifestyle. <laughs> the idea for me is that Pilates is living your life with consciousness and with care. It's not about mindless repetitions. It's not about doing at it. It's about really discovering yourself, your body, your mind, and spirit, and putting all of that together. When, what other time during your day do you get the opportunity to focus on who you are? It's about doing what you're doing while you're doing it. So you're being present in your body. And taking that time every day creates a lifestyle, something that extends far beyond your one hour or a day or for some of us six hours a day, but whatever it is. And we give that to that gift to ourselves, which we should be doing on a daily basis, each one of us as teachers, uh, taking the time to be present with who you are in your body, mind, and spirit. I think that um, we as teachers have this responsibility to live this life and to offer this to each and every one of our clients individually. Master teacher Bruce King had a saying, he said, you must meet each client where they are and take them farther than they think they can go. I think that's our goal as teachers and that is our goal as a lifestyle employee. I think of three things that I learned from one of my teachers, uh, Romana Krasinowska, who I did, I trained very extensively with, and one thing she said is, this is a workout, and above every body studio it should say, this is a workout. But then she also said, you need to teach to the body in front of you. And so every body is different, and you have to meet that, what that body is telling you. And something that Kathy had told me that she heard about from Eve was that, um, you know, a good Pilates teacher needs to be like a good musician. A good musician, you know, mm -hmm. cannot just uh, hear. They have, I mean, listen, they have to hear. And a good Pilates teacher cannot just look, they have to see. Mm -hmm. And you have to see what that body is telling you, what it needs. You have to read that body and then give the appropriate exercises for that body. And then the other thing that Romana used to always say was, um, Pilates is about improving somebody's quality of life. So how many times have one of your instructors, uh, one of your teachers come up to you and said, you know, I was in the bank the other day and I thought of you and I pulled up very tall and you know, my back was hurting. So people do take what they learn from Pilates and take it out there in the world. So I believe Pilates is a workout that becomes a lifestyle. And I myself, I started Pilates at 15 years old and um, I have muscular dystrophy and I, um, I have very loose, loose joints, and I did Pilates to get tighter and to make myself have a longer dancing career, and so my joints can be quite so flexible. And Pilates for me is a lifestyle. If I didn't do Pilates, one, I wouldn't be able to dance. I would have had my long dance career, but also I need it every day to, for pain management. And uh, so, yes, it's a workout. I love exercising. I love the high it gives me, but it's a lifestyle as well. I need Pilates for my life, for my well-being, because it improves my quality of life, and I think it improves all your clients' uh, quality of life. that has spread so quickly and become pervasive in like small towns where no one else does it. You know, like I was speaking to someone who 
she's the only one in her area and has to drive an hour to find someone else. So here this has really infected the entire world and you know, to the betterment of, of all of our clients and, and our lives. So I look at you and I think of myself and think you know, how excited I was to learn and, and you know, get as much knowledge underneath my belt so I could help each and every patient and client I work with. And, and that's what I think Pilates really is. It's, it's a lifestyle that is infectious to the degree that you become so passionate about it, you, you can't talk about it you know, with too many people. <laughs> they think you're losing it. You can't stop talking about it either. So, as I said, I agree with the entire thing. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think, a, to my understanding, at least from what you all said, um, there is there is one line I think we all already agree, which is simply that the workout grows to becomes a habit, yeah, which I, you use throughout your daily life, and thereby you create a better life for yourself, an easier life. Um, but I would like. I think to go a little bit in deeper into what you said and hear your opinions about that, which is what Joe always called this body-mind connection or yeah, spirit. Yes. Yeah, this is a very special word, spirit. He used it, yeah? And uh, I would be interested in, I mean, you said something about that, feeling present, yeah? Feeling <laughs> present and being by there more present also for your customers, yeah? For your clients in that moment. Um, do you... Not Kathy. <laughs> also, feel sometimes like, let's say, like doing a prayer or doing a kind of meditation while you're doing your workout, or uh, what are your, your feelings about that? Absolutely. I work out every day. I choose to do it at the end of the day because I find I sleep better <laughs> and uh, I, the body will feel better. And one, I am fortunate to have a small room, which is my gym, and I have one of everything there for myself. And I go in there, and it's absolutely, and I feel like I deflate, I compress, I just, it's, ha it's happiness. And uh, speaking of the spirit factor, which is, something I've been wanting, uh, I would like to see in Pilates explored more in, in depth because I am often asked, well, yeah, body, <coughs> mind, yes, but what about the spirit? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, I made it a point when I was thinking of, of organizing the, this Congress to introduce the spirit issue, and uh, we do have Several, uh, Robert Turner is going to be presenting. Put your yeah, stand up, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I have to say, it's a topic that my husband also, Iram Sintron, is very interested in. So he, they're doing one jointly. And I really think we need now to start to go a little deeper because we have all experienced mm -hmm. that feeling of detaching, of connecting, of call it meditation, call whatever it, however it feels. And it's very difficult to explain it sometimes to other people. And that is the spirit component. Mm -hmm. And definitely he believed, even though he never spoke of religion, he believed very much in this connection of the body, the mind, and the spirit. Mm -hmm. I um, I totally agree, and um, you know, spirit can mean so many different things to so many different people. Yes. And um, for me, spirit, like I agree with you, it's energy. And um, you know, I'm gonna mess it up now, but his Schiller quote was that he loved so much is at Erz die Geist, as in the Corporal Belt. Is that right? Correct? <laughs> and um, and it, he really did believe in the spirit. And we do think of body and mind, but we do forget the spirit. 
And um, spirit is non-corporal. You know, we have our body, we have our mind. And spirit is something that doesn't, that you cannot put your finger on because it's something that's not embodied. It's something that's out there. And um, you know, for me, I, when I used to work with Ramana, and when I work with Lolita, and when I work with all of my teachers, and when I, even with my clients and my students, there's an energy that happens. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's my spirit. I feel there's something very positive that happens, and I can't quite put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. But it's not body, it's not mind, and there's a special thing, it's energy. And I, for me, that's the spirit. It might be different for somebody else, but uh, I definitely think it's a very big part of our work. And, uh, Great, something we should not forget mm -hmm. about. And I would like to add to that that you know the spirit of this work is not defined, and I think that's really a good thing that that we get to experience that spirit individually and take that um, however we would like it to be. That it's not a set of rigid rules or or you must believe in something. That each one of us has had that experience, otherwise you wouldn't be here, because it, we're talking about this going into body-mind and then being present in your life. And to me, we get to have that moment in that spirit. You know, if you look at an athlete and, and who has just won a great competition, and, and you, they're interviewed and they say, well, you know, what made that? your personal best? What made that the best thing you've ever done? And the answer is usually something like, well, I was in the zone. Yeah. <laughs> well, what does that mean? I think that zone is where there is that final connection, mind, body, and spirit, where we are really focused on what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And that adds a different dimension to movement, to what we are experiencing while we are doing. But I think also, um, and I agree with everything you're saying, um, but I think as teachers we have to create an atmosphere, uh, whether we're teaching in a studio or one-to-one, -one, I think we have to create an atmosphere that will allow the person to, um, to, to open themselves up to, to, if it's spiritual, whatever it is. But if you don't have the, I hate this word, but the temple, you like for them to do that, um, it doesn't always happen. And I'm I'm very uh, conscious of of the atmosphere in my studio. Mm -hmm. That 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 it they don't. It's not a beating music. People are not allowed to gossip. They don't talk. Mm -hmm. And the atmosphere is very controlled by themselves rather than by the teacher. Although I must admit there is a bit of control. <laughs> 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 But you know they, 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 you give them the opportunity to find themselves because so often you'll get a client who comes in and you'll look at them and you go, my God, that person is so stressed. So as a teacher, there's no way that I'm going to, maybe they, I've seen them three days ago and they were fine and I would set out a program. There's no way that I teach that same program because I can recognize that there's something not quite right. So it is our responsibility to create um, the atmosphere or the environment that that person will be able to come down and get more out of the exercise. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, the, this is opening yourself out to your clients or to your pupils that you can, you start to sense what they need. And I think that's very important. There's a question? Yes, and point on that, I have a good example for that to, um, to find what up. the person needs. Tina, can, um, you, can you speak up a little bit louder and stand, stand up? Stand up. More of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I prefer to sit. No, be loud at least. He can see you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm missing my point, if I have to stand up. <laughs> So, um, so I have this client, and uh, she's uh, like 50 years, not more than 50 years, like 56 years old, and she came to me to uh, get, the, uh, get her body strong, and she's a lady who worked for like 30 years, and to, she had a burnout, that was the end of the story. 
And I was like, if I tell her what to do, what I think is the right for her, it's not going to work. So I started to say, um, okay, go ahead with this exercise, like a single leg stretch, and you decide what the point is when you finish. You know, it was uh, really interesting to give her back the re mm. uh, responsibility yeah. to yeah. yes uh, to to um, to realize where her <coughs> limit is and stuff like that. And um, while listening to you, each of one of you, I was like, yes, we all here and we all have more than of this Pilates style life. Uh, lifestyle, sorry for that. <laughs> um, it's um, because we are very sensitive people, mm -hmm. sensitive for commu communication and sensitive for the spirit and sensitive for all these um, uh, situation and, and emotions. And this is what um, is the whole thing, what I think. Mm -hmm. okay. I think it's amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I will often say, a client will come in and I look at her or him and I go, mm. and I just say, what would you like to start with today? Mm. Actually, I'd really like to sit down and do something, just read a book. I said, here's the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, read it if you want to. You know, if you want to do that, fine. And then they'll sit there and they say, okay, I think I might start now. Okay. Fine. <laughs> or a thought process where you know someone is their own higher power. So Alan, as you're saying, you know, allow that person to find themselves. Yes, they are their own higher power and they can allow themselves to achieve something greater than what they would have uh, done without that facilitation by you. So that is part of the meditative process that yes, I have that within me. I can do that, so mm -hmm. it's possible. <laughs> well, may, may I ask a question, especially to you, Lolita, because um, <coughs> the way we teach today, I think, is a little bit different to what Joe originated. Uh, to my understanding, Joe taught people exercises and left them alone with the exercise mm -hmm. over months. At least Jay, in an interview, described it also like that. Mm -hmm. So people had a long period of time where they kind of chewed on the exercise themselves instead of reading out everything and as you said last year uh, correcting the eyebrows of the people uh, are we still on the right track when it comes to bring the people to their body mind connection well the way we teach there were certain things that he expected first of all he did not allow music and uh, uh, I was there one day when a lady said to him, hey Joe, why don't we have some music? It's nice to work out to music. He said, music? Why do you need music? He said, every exercise has its own rhythm. The breathing has its own rhythm. He said, if I put music, you're going to start listening and you're going to start your mind will not be in the exercise, in the movement that you are doing, and you will be losing your body-mind connection. And this is so true. And at the same time, I can tell you that you could have gone every day and worked out next to this person, and all you knew was that person's name. No one spoke. You didn't chit chat, you didn't look, no. You just were there to work out, which immediately meant you really had to be focused on you. You were not. And so often I see that classes turn now into social gatherings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so detrimental. It's detrimental for the person because they don't really get the benefit mm -hmm. of being there. So uh, it's, it's important that, uh, to me, when a person walks in the door, I cannot start them out by saying, all right, we're going to do the 100. No, I cannot. Uh, first of all, you're going to sit down and you're going to breathe. And you're going to integrate your mind with your body. 
And the best way to do that is through breath, through deep breathing. I don't care how you do it, inhale, nose out, but to just calm yourself down, forget about the children, forget about the traffic, the lover, the job, whatever, and just bring the mind into the body. Can I ask you as a moderator, if you could uh, explore a little bit further with Alan and Lolita, something that Alan said earlier at some point in this conversation about uh, the fact that if Joseph were alive now, he probably wouldn't teach his uh, repertoire in the same way. And I think in the, in the exercise form, and when Alan talks about, uh, talks about taking flexion out of, of things uh, and other areas, uh, I often think and, uh, of the master trainers as sticking very closely, and there's a lot of talk about it, sticking very closely to the teachings of, of Joseph. And I find it very interesting that Alan would mm. pick something like flexion. I work in special populations a lot where flexion with osteoporosis causes a great deal of uh, damage and harm. Uh, and I'd be very interested at some stage if you could explore with the rest of the team um, that area, because I think it might help. Yeah. I think it's, it's a little bit problematic because last year we dedicated, let's say, a complete round to the topic of the future of Pilates and we have discussed this very lengthy. Uh, no, no, and it, was, it was a very good discussion. It would have been good to have Ellen at this point, but Ellen, you like maybe to respond at least to yeah, that? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, my firm belief is that we should honor the technique that he developed, but I still maintain he would have changed it if he was still alive. And I think um, we should think of the classical technique as a historical thing that we should know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I say hysterical because I think something <laughs> is hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> but we, what we have to remember is his principles. And his principles do not need to be 34 exercises that starts with 100. Mm -hmm. I don't do the 100 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, if we look at his principles, which I think stand on their own, Absolutely. and work with those in mind, however you do the exercise, or whatever you do, keep those principles in mind. And I say, don't forget the technique, knowing and continue to know where you're, you're coming from. And that is, that is my background, and I won't forget it, but I feel that I, I've got it there if I need it, but I need to look ahead and who I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. As you say, with someone with osteoporosis, your, your, uh, your program is completely different. So, think, your, uh, so your mind-body connection and spirit connection then are not related to the repertoire, they're related it's to... It's related to the person. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Related to the person. And what I'd like to add is that um, Joseph Pilates was a visionary. And he said, I am 50 years ahead of my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he said that 50 years ago. So we have to not stay stagnant. Mm -hmm. We have to explore his work from his words, from his principles. But we also need to have a vision on, uh, for ourselves, for the future of his work, and to honor him. If you've got a client who comes into your studio who's very fit, you can do the whole technique, mm. and that's great. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying don't do it, but if you've got someone that can, can deal with all that, it's fantastic. But I, what I'm saying is don't do it to everyone. <laughs> be aware of who you've got in front of you. I think it would be good, Brent, if you say something, yes. because I think last year more or less you said what Alan just said. Yeah, I think that uh, going back to when I learned from Ramana, in a way she was almost like a dichotomy where she would work with myself or someone who was, you know, somewhat able-bodied and we would do the classical repertoire, but when you watched her with her clients, she would not do that repertoire. She would create things for the client who was in front of them and I think that's actually how Joseph Plotty's work because, you know, we have such a richness bodies in our history because we have so many people who work with them. 
And everyone had their own experience in working with Joseph Pilates because they had their own bodies, different bodies from different people. You know, when I came to Ramana, I was very able to body, but I also had muscular dystrophy, I had a knee issue. So I learned many different things from my body, you know, that were specific for my knee. I also had a shoulder injury for my shoulder. When Ramana came to Joe, she came to him for ankle injury, knee injury. Uh, Kathy, knee injury, everyone had their own different experience. So I think we start to categorize us, you know, it's this, it's that, but Pilates is much more than just, you know, certain repertoire. You know, I don't think he's stuck to his own repertoire. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, if we don't honor our richness and, the, you know, how broad Pilates really is, it's not just a series of exercises. But, you know, it is a lifestyle, and it's a, like what you were saying earlier, it's about seeing the body in front of you, meeting that body. I think Joseph Pilates did it. I know my teachers have done it. I do it with my clients, and I'm pretty sure everyone also does it with their clients. And um, so I think we need to quit boxing ourselves and realize how rich, you know, our work is. Yeah. Yeah. True visionaries don't ever stop. You know, true people who are like Joseph was, and as Lolita explained, when he was not happy and felt like he hadn't done everything he can, um, that shows that he wanted to do more. He wanted to push it further. He wanted to, so it's, it wasn't going to stop if he'd lived another 50 years. Mm -hmm. It would have metamorphosized into something like it has today with everyone's different perspectives being integrated. And I really think that's where it should be. Um, I'd like to touch on something that I think relates to both things, the spirit and, and this discussion, which is, I think, us as teachers um, are role models, basically, to our clients. And if we're teacher trainers, to our students. And in, in terms of the spirit, I think people, when they just come through your door, they immediately assess who you are as a teacher. And they can be attracted to that, they can be not attracted to that, and it could marry really well together and there could be a lot of clashes as well. And I have a lot of clients who I clash with all the time, but it's almost like they come to clash with <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I was actually present there last week when I told someone, you know, I don't think it can work like this. But I, I just knew that if I say it, if you want to keep doing this, then don't come at all. She will want to come even more. It's almost like that's what she wants. But I'm, I'm not, you know, no one is perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm just who I am. But I think in terms of the spirit, when, when you are clear with who you are, then people can communicate clearly with who you are and with your spirit. And it takes a lot of work to know who you are. And I think it takes a lot of work, and that's something that I agree with everyone here, but something that I didn't hear or maybe hasn't noticed, that it takes a lot of hard work to know both worlds. It takes decades of practice Experience. to know both worlds, to be able to really embody the classical work and also understand how to apply the more contemporary approach to that. And people, I think, tend to go into boxes because they only learn the box. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first experience was math classes from Romana style, that was previous to my training under Deborah. And I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I was doing Pilates. And then a few years later, I started doing something that was influenced from Deborah. And still I had no idea. That was 12, 13 years ago. I had no idea. And, and then I did rail. And it was like, it was just these boxes. And only recently, a lot of it thanks to Christy there. <laughs> we know much more about styles and about different approaches yes. and we are, you know, we can open to understanding the bigger concepts but very often people come to teacher training courses 
without much previous knowledge at all. They are accepted to these programs without knowing what Pilates is. And then they go through a very intensive course and they have to really box things together in order to just succeed in that course. And then they cling on to it for dear life because that's all they know. So how can you open up to something if all you know is something that's very confined and that you really have to stick onto it in order to think that you do your job properly. So it's, it's, it's a tricky thing in, in today's yes. world Today. that, and, and you guys know better than I do, that it didn't used to be like that. You had to, uh, I remember Michelle Larson saying how she trembled after years of training when she first approached, I think Eve, mm -hmm. in asking her to observe and you know to start the process of years of becoming a teacher today people just take it for granted so i think you know you cannot talk about the future of pilates or or anything else without i think in my view taking this into account mm -hmm. that important point um, and I'm curious what the panel would say about um, I think the box is part of everyone's initial start is important I think it's almost like you have to go there first but um, it's somewhere along the way we all start interjecting ourselves into the process and I think to, to me I'm, that's the language and the vocabulary I don't think we have yet um, about body mind spirit and I'm curious what you all might say about if, if, the, if the exercises are the vehicle for transformation, which, or some version of that, you maybe think of, of allowing people to experience themselves, what part of you, your own body, mind, spirit experience, do you also impart on the client to facilitate out of the box or further along? And if so, can we write it down because we need the work? Is that the next training? So you want us to put it in a box? Yeah. <laughs> well, to me, to me, and I'll be frank because I've helped, and you may think I'm going to be crazy with what I say. When we start to talk about the spirit, I think it's an extraordinarily slippery slope. Yeah. It is. And the reason is, is because there are too many people who don't have, and I mean those of us who teach, and sometimes I include myself, and a lot of times I include myself in that, in the responsibility that you have of being a teacher. So, and the only reason I caveat on this is because I've seen a lot of people who come into Pilates and have this extraordinary, extraordinary connection, and they become transformed, and they want to share it, which is what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But you have responsibility, and you have to be present. And if you get caught off on that sidebar of going into the spirit discussion, that's not your job. You have to do that by embodying who you are in the moment teaching and by being your person, which is what I think everybody is saying, you will allow the other person to have that. But don't talk about that. You can't, you can't, you have to be careful. You just have to recognize it. What? This is opinion. No, no, I agree with the I just no, I can't. No, you can't, you can talk about it, but I think that I've been in places, and I'll give you other examples because I've done a lot of traveling in a lot of places, and people start to say, well, how are you feeling today? And you know, and, and you know, and you know, if you're doing this, and are you at peace right now? I don't want to know about that. You know, you, Alan said it, you can, you can see, you know, what do you, what you, you can sense from the client, what would you like to do today? Let's, let's do this. But you're there to facilitate something, and more or less you're a conduit. You have responsibility in your teaching. So I think that's something we have to remember to a certain extent. And you sometimes have to be present. And I keep coming back to that word because I love that word. Mm -hmm. Present. If you're present, it flows. And it's something that I can't explain sometimes because when I do teacher training or I'm working with someone, someone will say, why did you do that? And it's the same thing because I've worked with Lolita before and Michelle Larson before and I've seen what Eve's done and all of those things. And I have the same answer that Eve used to tell Michelle, which is, 
I don't know. It just felt like I should yeah, do it. Exactly. And I can't yeah. explain it. Yeah. And if I get too airy-fairy about it, <laughs> and I've done it before when I was a younger teacher, people get freaked out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just let it flow. Let it come out and, and let it happen. And, and I don't know how you teach that. I don't. I, I think it takes experience because it's so Yeah, it, it's, it's responsibility and experience. It's so, it's so easy to be sucked into someone's problem yes. in, in, the, in the studio. And uh, I, I, my feeling is when I go into my studio, I have a glass shield <laughs> and it bounces off me. Because if I get in, I, I won't get involved if there's a divorce or there's this and there's that and they're feeling like terrible because that interferes with it all. Totally. I don't want to know. But I want to help them, but I don't want to disgust. You will do something to help them through that without talking about it. And if I hear one of my teachers go on about it, I just quietly ask them if they've changed their profession. <laughs> I say, have you become a therapist because you're an exercise teacher? Susan. I, I, think I Susan also was... just wanted to say about the box that I think we as teachers also have to understand that not every client is for us either. That, you know, sometimes another, per, you know, I think we, in the States we get very competitive and, you know, we're all trying to make money. But sometimes we need to let the client go to another studio where that being is actually more connected from that other person. So the respect that we get from each other, sometimes I can't always train somebody, but I know another Pilates teacher would really be better for them. So to not be competitive and to allow that community to happen. I think, I think, I, I think I'm very lucky in that I've got a situation where I've got about 10 teachers. Mm -hmm. And I know that some clients will suit one teacher rather than the other, so in fact, I don't get upset if someone says, I want to work with so-and-so, because I know that that will work. And, it, and I say, you sh I like to think we shouldn't be competitive. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think we have to recognize that there are so many different styles uh, of Pilates these days. And I think we should recognize that and not saying, what I do is the only way. Mm -hmm. You know, just say, actually, your style is different, but I appreciate that, but let's talk. Mm -hmm. And, the, and this is why I think these sort of conferences are so useful, that teachers can come and get a taste of other styles and maybe <coughs> create their own with a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you know, make a, 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 a little cooking job with it. And to create, for younger teachers to create their own style, which I think is important. And I also think that that is our, really our vision, that you know, we really need to, to learn the work thoroughly. But each one of us is experiencing that work differently. Mm -hmm. So that your hundred and my hundred are completely different, even if on the outside they look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. What I'm experiencing in my own body is a different um, experience than what you are having. And, and it, it does, it takes years and years and years. And I think that one of the things that I know everyone here agrees with is that you never stop learning this work. That it is an ongoing process. Uh, and you know, some of the things that I'm teaching now, I, I think to myself, well, why didn't I teach that? 10 or 15 years ago, because I didn't know it. I needed to take that much time to get it into my bones and then to be able to share it from, as we're all saying, from who we are and who we are becoming as teachers. Remind me never to share my experience of the hundred with you. <laughs> now there's a challenge. <laughs> Can, can I just ask Kevin to clarify? You don't mean that we cannot share it with ourselves, right? What? Not just not the uh, the spirit thing. Yes. You're, you're happy. I'm asking for us to discuss it. You just don't think that we should be telling our clients, you know, the, talking to. Them. I, I think it's I think it's a responsibility. I think you know that it, it's there. I, this is my opinion. I think that you know that it's there, and I think that you've embodied it, of course, when you learn Pilates and, and you learn you know, your connection and your transformation to it. 
but I, I don't think that, and I think you can have a discussion about it, I just don't think it should be so embodied into uh, whatever you're doing on a daily basis that yeah, it becomes plus. a little icky, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, and, and I'm sorry, and I, and, and I hate to say this, but we're not teaching yoga. Yeah. And part yeah. of the reason why people come to Pilates <laughs> is because we're teaching them something we're teaching them something that's really good for them, and we're really good at what we do, and we're we're putting the conduit connection together to make it happen. And you know, it comes up. You talk about it, but I've been in places where it becomes discussed, and it's it just feels like it's not right. It just doesn't feel like that's that. This at least that's not how I learned it. Yeah. It was my, I agree with you. It was my personal experience. I try to teach that on my own person. When I teach, I do my own thing. But I don't want, I don't even want the people I train to start to talk like that because to me, you're, you're touching on something that is very personal and if you're really good at what you do, all you have to do is be mm -hmm. yeah. and you will make it happen. That's yeah. my opinion. And that's why I'm saying that it shouldn't be defined in a sense that, you know, this is what it is because for every person, it's going to be different. And, exactly. and it's have going to, to change and evolve. And it's as going you to do. change and evolve so. as you do. And as you deepen your understanding of the exercises, you deepen the understanding of your own experience with that. Which is why I, I think as teachers, we have another responsibility. And, and that is, um, well, this is um, an abdominal exercise. You should feel your abdominals. I would never <laughs> say that to a person because what happens if they're not feeling their abdominals? They're going to think either I'm doing it wrong or this teacher is really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is they have to allow, you have to allow the experience and to get that from each and individual. And that is done through the process of experience, experience, experience. and then experience. 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours, I yes. Maybe in a very practical way, to, if I understand your question correctly, Christy, there is something I just gave um, someone a teaching exam yesterday, and she was instructing her client so well. But after half an hour, I had to stop her and say, Okay, I've seen enough of that. Now I'd like to see you teaching the client. Yes. I'd like to I'd like you to stop fiddling around and saying everything that you know about everything <laughs> and just step back and say one thing and make it valuable. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't. Not not because she she's not capable of doing that, but because she was so trained or she trained herself to to do that, to either overcome an obstacle in herself or, or to fill in the gaps to, so she seems as a good teacher by constantly saying things. And, and she had this barrier, so on a very practical level, I think in teacher training courses, students can, if that was your question, I think students need to have that time under supervision to experience that, to, to have those what do you see here? What you know? What would you say that is valuable to that person in that moment? Which is not an instruction, which is which has got a teaching quality to it. And and I think this is something very practical that could help students at least understand they're no, working I, I, towards that level. I think that's missing in a lot of the training courses now. I mean, I because I. I, I, I had a nine months apprenticeship with Bob Fitzgerald, which was 12 hours a day in the studio. And you know, you, you learn to look at things. And I think it's so important that the observation and just watching mm -hmm. is so important. So I think, first you, Christy? Can I just follow? Yes, and then you and you, right? Yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah, okay, but then. Um, yes, uh, that was definitely where my question was based. I mean, and um, having, I, I've had the privilege everybody, almost Reiner yesterday, so, <laughs> <laughs> with the exception of Aaron, and, and I feel it, you know, there's something happening between when I take Kevin's class and take Alan's class, and, and I, I understand the presence, I love the answers, I really appreciate it, I can leave it at that, but I was interested to know if, let's say we did it on our own level, is there, is, do you think it needed, my question was, do you think 
there should be a place for um, the words. And I, I'm not really thinking airy fairy yoga, quite honestly. I'm thinking just about personal exploration and holding space, acknowledging the space for personal exploration out loud with a word, rather than. So, and, and, and I'm hearing not so much, because it will happen with the experience, and that has, in fact, been my experience. So I, I appreciate the answer very much, and it did stem from what you said to me. Yeah. So, thank you. I, I'll go back and answer that, and I'm sure you guys have something to say. Yes, I, think I, I would say something to my clients, but I say it in my way. Sure. And I think, that, and, and yeah. I say it in a way, for example, that would be a little funny, because that's just kind of how I like to teach. And also in a statement that it will allow them to go do something. Because yeah. I would ask them to go do their personal exploration at home, and I would kid with them and say, you know, I don't know what to do. Do you have a glass of wine when you go home? Do you smoke a joint? I don't know. Go <laughs> home. Do that. Lay down on the ground and get in touch with your body for a few yeah. moments if you don't want to do that here. And see if you can do a couple of things on your own without me being here. I see the value in not defining it. Yeah, and so and I think that that's what I do. <laughs> Is it right for everyone? Probably not. Not at all. But I think there is a place there, but I, I, it's just that responsibility and being present with your client that I think is what's key to making it happen. Thank you. That's good. As far as um, exploring the, you know, the higher power or the spirit and whatnot, you don't necessarily have to tell someone that they have that within themselves. <coughs> Know, you have this higher power. You can suggest that uh, let's focus on breathing. And that alone may bring about a meditative quality, as well as, well, let's try lowering your legs a bit lower to the ground. And that may also facilitate them working to you know, a greater level so that it's not so obvious that you're trying to bring about that, you know, spirit connection with them, but they have it within themselves if you suggest it. You're facilitating it. And, you know, the same with that uh, concept of focus. Let's work on breathing. Let's work on precision and control. And if they are truly focusing on it, that will bring that about within that, you know, that will bring it about within that person where they, you know, there it's a focus. It's not necessarily something about spirit, but they do have it within themselves. So that's really what I was suggesting with that other comment. And, um, you know, they, they are able to do it with your help. Thank you. Uh, yes, mine was just basically a comment uh, as to your uh, comments about the, the instructor exam yesterday, was it yesterday I meant, about the uh, girl who was doing the exam and she was instructing very well. And I think that probably most of the time when you have new teachers that come in and literally do everything by the book, they just want to perfect everything. Mm -hmm. And as Alan was saying, they're not really, they're looking but they're not seeing. And as a good instructor, I go back to what Kathy was saying about Pilates not being um, um, an exercise of mindful um, repetitions. It's the teacher has to be in it as well to see what their their client is doing, and not just give cue uh, repetitively for nothing. Basically, cue on what you're seeing, and I think that's what sets us out from being good teachers. Yes. And but also, I think if you've got a client who's doing five things incorrectly, you can't cure them. You, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't cure. If you said all five, they would leave you and sort of shoot yes. themselves. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you have to decide is that you decide out of those five now which are the two most, most important, important things, mm -hmm. or even one. Let's work on this for a while, mm -hmm. and then gradually introduce the other ones. Because I see some of my teachers curing people to death. <laughs> and I think this is another thing about cueing. I don't think we can learn cues. We can't read a book and say, right, for this exercise, these are my cues that I'm going to use. The mm -hmm. cues are something that your client will understand. Mm -hmm. And your list of cues may not be in their frame of reference. So you have to look and discover what that client understands and then cue them in, in their language, if you like. Yes, because not everybody understands this. Absolutely not. Exactly. Yeah. 
And oftentimes, I mean, I agree with you, Alan, because as a society, we're overstimulated. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And I learned a technique from a PhD psychologist, Dr. Russell Warren, where you can reset your, your client's sensory system before they even start their session. So I do that for some of my, my clients so that they start off fresh before I ask them to do anything because they've just come in from you know, work or the house or traffic and the news and they've already, their sensory system has been bar 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 bombarded and the last thing they need from me is for me to do the same thing to them. So I, I agree wholeheartedly and heartedly about you know, over-queuing is, is detrimental. And I think to uh, talk about what Amit was saying, we're not, I mean, we have to think ourselves as not as uh, instructors, but as teachers and as an educator, you know, I, I definitely have philosophies that I believe in. One is experiential learning, which is by a guy named John Dewey, and another one is called Multiple Levels of Intelligence by um, um, Howard Gardner. And, um, and the reason why I decided to, put, to talk about those two really quickly is that um, you have to teach to the experience of your client, and um, everyone has their own subjective experiences. They have their own, exp uh, there are you know, a combination of different experiences. So you, know, you cannot definitely cue everyone the same because everyone has a different experience and everyone's a different learner. So Howard Gardner talks about you know, nine different intelligences, and you have to teach to the intelligence of your client. It may not be your intelligence, but you have to have some sort of rapport to find out how to best meet that client's needs. And then to go back to uh, experiential learning, um, there's about honoring your experiences and then having a reflection component about it as well. And you have to reflect on the learning that was met. And then otherwise, you cannot, I mean, it's hard to continue to learn if you have not reflected on it. And I think that that you know, ties a little bit back in about bodies being lifestyle and how it's not just exercise. And, um, you know, and with spirit, we get, I mean, once again, you know, spirit means so many different things for different people. For me, it means energy. For someone else, it could be something different. And I think we shouldn't really categorize spirit. But we know there is a body and mind. And spirit can be whatever it is for whoever. Right. But um, I think that if we don't have body, mind, and spirit, then it's not a lifestyle. And I think it is just exercise. And not that we, you know, we do have to get airy-fairy with it. But you know, there is a component about it that is, you know, part of our work. And I agree, you have to be present. And you don't. Maybe you're not saying, "I want you to feel this." <laughs> but, um, but you know, without that spirit component, it is just movement. And you know, I believe Pilates is, is a lifestyle. And, and you know, you have to reflect on what you have done to improve on it, and to take it outward and to apply it to everyday daily tasks. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's you know, definitely body, mind, and spirit and why it is a nice mm, Thank you so much. I would like to, to have two more statements, if that's OK, El, from you and from Lolita, uh, maybe as tips for us all, because you, El, spoke about that in your studio. How can we, let's say, what can we do when we go back to our studios, or to our work as Pilates teachers, to enable or to create the space, as you said, in your studio. And Lulita would ask you the same question. But Ellen, would you like to start as you have the last word? Um, oh it's a difficult one. Yes. Take your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I just, I mean, I, I create an atmosphere in my studio that, that, uh, that involves music but very, very uh, carefully controlled music, classical music. Silence, no, no gossiping, and running around. And just, the, 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 I think the main thing is, I like my clients. Mm. And I think, I mean, I don't want to take them to dinner or, or <laughs> But or go to bed with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, occasionally. <laughs> but no, seriously, very seriously. Because, because I like them, and I'm concerned about how they, um, how they perform, and how I can improve their well-being, 
it makes a very, very good feeling. And I think if you're going to, t and the way we teach, it's very important the way we teach. It's not just throwing their legs around, we're creating something. And we have to feel for that person to be able to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan, when people go to your studio, and I've never been to your studio, but I have a number of people who have come from your studio to come into courses, they, they talk about your space as very different from the classical studio space. They're not talking about the equipment that is in the studio yeah. that they're exercising on. They're talking about, and I've always had the impression of, almost soft areas within and an atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> have, I got this, have I got this wrong? But no, no, you have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, cre it's creating a space where pe people feel comfortable and safe. And I think safety, and I don't mean about tripping over right. one of the reformers. It, it means <laughs> they feel they're safe, that they're going to be looked after, and I think this is important. And that they're not, I mean, it's not that we give them an easy time. I mean, we make them work, but they feel safe. And I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Lolita. Well, it's uh, wonderful to hear this whole discussion because Frankly, when I went to both Corolla and Joseph Pilatus, it was very clear you were going there for a workout. Now, I went as a client to Corolla, and then I also apprenticed with Corolla, and then I went as, as an apprentice to Joe and Clara. And I was there for four hours, so I could experience uh, every five days a week, so I could experience people just going in and out. And you were expected to be in the door, and an hour later you were on your way out. Mm -hmm. There was very little conversation, like I mentioned before, and Joe was not a person that was liked, uh, he did not like to be asked too many questions. If uh, you said, uh, if you were not getting something, his uh, answer would be, do it again, <laughs> do it again. And you usually ended up getting your own answer through repetition. But obviously ingrained in his principles and ingrained in the work that he was teaching us, there was so much more that he did not particularly verbalize and I, you did not take notes. I was uh, not ever given a note. And I see some of you like Shakespeare when I'm teaching, you know, writing. Like <laughs> <And, and>, uh, <laughs> it, it was uh, not that way, and yet there was something that has developed that we have each contributed, taken that beautiful basis, those ABCs, like Clara said, you have to learn your ABCs. Once you have your ABCs, so, you know, run, may go, whatever, and that's fine, you know? And, but it's wonderful how you have all explored it and taken it, really, beyond what was the concept <coughs> being taught from him directly. And as you know, he only wrote two books, and we have gone through those books, and we have really held on to every word to try to get, you know, the essence and the principles of, of his work. And uh, so much, so much of it also, we have to realize that back in 19, from the 20s to 67 that he died, it was a totally different world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally different. I mean, first of all, ladies did not really go to gyms, as I've told you, 60% of our clientele is males. And uh, uh, people did not discuss uh, their mind, body, and spirit freely like we do today. And uh, uh, a lot of it was uh, not being discussed. Uh, I would say to much later, after Joe died, that it started to evolve. And that's one of the reasons why I think it is wrong to box 
Pilates, to try to keep it where he left off. Because it was, the posture was different, people were not sitting in front of a computer, people's uh, lifestyle in the city of New York, of, you know, walking endlessly up and down stairs, everything was very different from today. And if Joe were alive today, I am certain that Pilates would be different from what it was back then. But I think it's wonderful how we have taken it and we have evolved it. And I think this is very good and that I believe continued education is a must. You never can say, you know, I learned, I'm certified, I have a piece of paper, I'm done. No, you have to keep learning and you have to maintain an open mind to the many ways and, ex and uh, you don't have to accept it, but you have to really think on it. It's for me, it's not for me, right? And that's how our method is going to keep evolving, growing, and truly helping society, which is what we all want to do and what he wanted to do. He really, truly wanted to change the world through his method. And his frustration at the end of his life was that he had not accomplished that. But when I say to you, he named that apparatus the universal reformer, was because he thought of himself as a universal reformer. And obviously the basis that he left us was reforming universally, and we have been doing that. And that wonderful, and I say bravo to you.